This is Ray Mossholder with a brand new book, Taylor Caldwell. Where did you hear that name? Well, I'm audiobooking another of her books right now, but this one, wow, what a book, just like the other, only better. And yet, the other is so great. I, Judas. Chapter one of this book will bring you into it speedily. Now, Taylor said she's in heaven now, so I'll just have to tell you myself. Taylor said that she took 26 years to write this book after studying and studying and studying because Luke was her favorite subject. And you'll tell it by hearing this book. So let's start. Chapter 1. Lucanus was never sure whether he liked or disliked his father. He was only certain that he pitied him. Simple men of no pretensions could be admired. Wise men could be honored. But his father wasn't simple or wise, though he considered himself wise. Bookkeepers and record gatherers had their important place in life, especially if they were diligent, knew that they had a value as bookkeepers and record gatherers, and didn't imply they possessed larger gifts. It wasn't good when they spoke of lesser men in highly cultured and superficial tones. But the mother of Lucanus smiled so tenderly and so mercifully when her husband intoned his ridiculous prejudices that the light of her compassion mollified her son. There was a matter of Anus bathing his hands in goat's milk each morning and night rubbing the rich fluid into every wrinkle and crevice and joint carefully by the time he was 10 years old lucanus understood that his father was not merely trying to soften and whiten his hands but was attempting to obliterate the scars of earlier servitude this irritated Lucanus, for even then he knew that work of any kind was not degrading unless it became so in the mind of the worker. But when Ennis shook his wet hands delicately to dry them in the soft Syrian air, Lucanus could see the disfigured areas on the palms and the long, ugly cicatrix on the back of the slender right hand. And his pity came to him in a flood of vague love. But his real understanding was still childish. Ennis was at his best when just before the evening meal he would pour the customary libation to the gods. Lucanus always watched him then with a veneration that was without words. His father's voice, so thin and meager and lofty, as a rule became humble and hesitant. He had gratitude that the gods had freed him, had made possible this small and pleasant house in its gardens of palms and flowers and fruit trees, had lifted him from the dust and had granted him authority over other men. But the most solemn event to Lucanus was when Ennis refilled the wine cup and even with even more reverence, poured out the red liquid slowly and carefully 
and said with almost inaudible softness, to the unknown God. Tears would fill the large blue eyes of 10-year-old Lucanus, the unknown God. The libation was not only an ancient custom of the Greeks to Lucanus, it was a mystic salutation, a universal rite. Lucanus would watch the falling ruby drops and his heart would clench with an almost unbearable emotion as if he were witnessing the spilling of divine blood, the offering of an inscrutable sacrifice. Who was the nameless and unknown God? And his would answer his son. It was a custom of the Greeks to perform this ritual to him, and it was necessary to maintain civilized Grecian custom when one lived among Roman barbarians, even barbarians who ruled the world. His scarred hands would fold themselves in an unconscious gesture of homage, and his narrow face, so insignificant and ordinary, acquired distinction and gravity. It was then that Lucanus was sure he loved his father. Lucanus had been carefully tutored by his father about the gods, for whom he used Grecian names and not the gross names given them by the Romans. Even so, with their poetic and lovely names, they were, for Lucanus, merely men grown gigantic and immortal, possessing all man's cruelty, rapacity and lust, and hatred and malice. But the unknown God appeared not to possess the attributes of man, neither his vices nor his small virtues. Anus had once told his son, the philosophers have taught that he is not to be comprehended by man, but he is mighty, omniscient, and omnipresent, circumbient, yet in every particle that, that is being, whether tree or stone or mankind. So say the deathless thinkers of our people. The boy is too serious for his age, Anus once said to his wife Iris. However, one should remember that his grandfather, my father, was a poet and so I must not be too censorious. Iris knew that the poet grandfather was one of her husband's more pathetic fictions, but she nodded in agreement. Yes, our son has the soul of a poet, and yet I see and hear him playing with great liveliness with a little rubria. They chase the sheep together and hide from each other among the olive trees. And sometimes their childish laughter is boisterous and loud. She watched her husband gently as he lifted his long head with importance and attempted to frown. In his poor heart, he was flattered for all his contempt for the Romans. I trust he does not neglect his lessons. With all the respect to my employer, it is hard to forget that he is a Roman barbarian. 
and that his daughter can't offer my son any intellectual diversion. However, one must remember that he's only 10 years old and the little Rubria is still younger. You say, my dear one, that they play constantly together. I have noticed, but then I'm busy from dawn to sunset in the Tribune's house. Lucanus assists Rubria with her own lessons. Iris shook a golden lock from her forehead. How unfortunate it is that the noble tribune, Diodorus Serenus, doesn't employ you to teach her. Anus sighed and touched his wife's forehead with his grateful lips. But who then would manage these Roman affairs in Antioch and keep the records and supervise the overseers of the slaves? Ah, oh, these greedy, sucking Romans. Rome is an abyss into which all the wealth and labor of the world sinks without a sound. An abyss from which no music rises or has risen. Iris considerately forbode to remind her husband of Virgil, and as usually compared him disdainfully with Homer. It offended Anus that his employer was only a rude tribune and not an Augustal. True, many of the Roman tribunes were Augustals, but not Diodorus, who loathed the patricians and whose hero was Cincinnatus. Diodorus had considerable education and much intellect and was the son of a sound and virtuous family of many soldiers. But he pretended to the soldiers scorn for men who preferred the things of the mind. He hugged his old-fashioned virtues to his breast and affected ignorance of the things he knew and spoke in the harsh and civil accents of a soldier to whom books were contemptible. In his way, he possessed as many affections as Amos. They were both frauds. Iris would tell herself sadly, but they were also piteous frauds. Let Ennis con condescend to the soldier whose father had freed him, and let Diodorus deliberately use bad grammar and display bad manners. It didn't matter. The father of Diodorus Arrhenius, a moral man of noble qualities, had brought the young Ennis from an acquaintance he had bought him bought the young Anus from an acquaintance who had been noted for his extreme cruelty to his slaves, a cruelty which had become infamous even among a callous and cynical people. It was told that there was none of this man's slaves who didn't bear scars. From the workers in the fields and vineyards, and olive groves to the youngest females in the house. Nor, in spite of the laws, did he desist from the wanton killing, at will, of any slave who displeased him. And he had devised manners of torture and murder, which gave him immense pleasure. An Augustale of proud if decadent family and of immense wealth and power. He was also a senator, and it was said that even Caesar feared him. 
There was only one man in Rome who dared to scorn him publicly, the virtuous tribune Priscus, father of Diodorus, who was loved by the Roman mobs, who themselves debased and vicious as their masters, yet paid him honor for his integrity and his soldierly qualities. The mobs even admired him for his kindness and his justice to his slaves. And this was paradoxical among a people to whom a slave was less than a four-legged beast. Anus, the Greek slave, had been one of the workers on the senator's land. And no one was quite certain how Priscus had acquired him, except Anus, and he never spoke of it. But Priscus had brought the wounded and broken youth to his house, had called his physician to treat him, had assigned him a place in his household, and had required only obedience from him. We are all subject to obedience, Priscus had told his new slave sternly. I obey the gods and the laws of my fathers, and there is pride in such subjection, for it's voluntary and demanded of all honorable men. The man without discipline is a man without a soul. Anus was illiterate, but he was quick and respectful and had a shrewd and orderly mind. Priscus, who believed every man, even a slave, should be developed to his full capacity, had permitted Anus to sit in a corner of a room where his young son was being tutored. Within an amazingly short time, Anus had caught up with Theodorus. His memory was astounding. It wasn't long until Anus, at the command of Priscus, was sitting at the foot of the table where Theodorus sat with his tutor. Have we a Greek scholar here? Priscus asked the tutor ironically, but the tutor replied with sagacity that Anus was no true scholar, but only a young man of a clever mind. By the time Anus was 25, he was managing the Roman estates of his master Priscus. While Diodorus had taken up his proper profession as a soldier, and was assisting the procurator in Jerusalem. He had also fallen in love with another slave, the young Iris, handmaiden to the wife of Priscus, a beautiful Greek girl, the pet of the household, educated personally by Antonia, who regarded her with the affection of a mother. Priscus and Antonia had presided over the wedding of the young people and had given them many gifts, including the priceless one of their freedom. Diodorus Serenius, returning home after the death of his parents, had been pleased with the freedman Anus for the Roman estates were in fine order. He remembered his old fellow student as being a commonplace fellow of no particular brilliance, but he recognized his qualities and honesty, though he was annoyed at the petulances and small arrogances he displayed against the slaves under his command. But as Diodorus was extremely intelligent and secretly merciful, he understood that in this way, 
Ennis was compensating for the years of his own slavery. The lonely young Roman, who is now 27, five years younger than Ennis, soon married a young woman of a sturdy Roman family who had his own robust qualities, but not his intelligence. And shortly after this, Theodorus was assigned to govern Antioch in Syria, and he took Anus and Iris with him. Here, Anus found wider scope for his talents of meticulousness and management and bookkeeping and precision. And for the first time, he had a home of his own on the estate in the suburbs of Antioch. In the evenings, he dreamt his dreams of the glorious men of old Greece and identified himself with them and read the poems of Homer and declaimed them aloud to his wife and son. His learning intellectually remained small and meager. He prated of Socrates, but the dialogues were beyond his real comprehension. He knew very little of the lesser giants of Greece and almost nothing of the statesmen of his nation. He served his gods as dutifully as he served Diodorus. Perhaps they meant Greece to him. Perhaps in their loveliness and delicacy and splendor, they reminded him that their Roman counterparts were gross and lascivious and brutish. In his gods, Anus found refuge from his memories of bitter slavery. In them he found pride for himself, for even Romans honored them and built temples to them and began to draw distinctions between them and their own deities. Anus had preferred Rome to Antioch, for though he disdained the Roman rabble, he'd liked the bustle in the crowded streets and the excitements of the city and the air of power. Antioch to him was too foreign for it was constantly being invaded by rough seamen from hundreds of nameless and doubtful barbarous places. He had a conspicuous aversion for them and would shudder at them fastidiously. But he had a small and pleasant house of his own with cool stone floors and bright woolen curtains and arches and gardens and it was far enough away from the larger house of Diodorus to give him the illusion that he was a master of land in his own right. Much of this pleasure, however, was spoiled frequently for him when he came into contact with Theodorus and was forced to listen in silence to the Roman soldierly expletives and coarse language. Theodorus was even lonelier in Syria than he had been in Rome. His wife Aurelia was a buxom young woman who devoted herself to her household and her slaves and her husband and her young daughter. She was pious and virtuous in the matter of an old Roman matron, but she was unlearned and only shrewd and as naturally unpolished as her husband was naturally, if secretly, polished. She chattered about the slaves, her daughter, the newest fashions from Rome, suspected depredations in the kitchen, the climate, 
the health of her family, and the dishes she herself concocted under the eyes of the cooks. There was no doubt she was an estimable woman, and there was no doubt that though she was trifle too fat, she had much prettiness of round pink face, large brown eyes, and luxurious black hair. The Adorans would listen to her fondly, and then would retire to his library where to bring books out of his assiduous hiding and read until midnight, long after all in the household had retired. He especially delighted in poetry and history and philosophy. He would whisper a whole poem to himself with a kind of wanton and abandonment to phrases and cantos. Never occurred to him as an anacrostically moral Roman to seek some sexual diversion in the teeming brothels of Antioch. Nor did he consider it proper to gather together with some fellow Romans in the city for gaming or cockfighting, or even simple companionship. A man's place after his work was in his home, according to Diodorus, no matter how trivial his wife's conversation. He drank very little at the table and believed drunkenness to be one of the major sins. So he had no escape except his work. Aurelia had women friends among the Roman families in Antioch, but they were as virtuous and ordinary as she herself. She and they would gossip about the more emancipated women of their acquaintanceship and would deplore them with shivers. They were all completely and innocently unaware of the depravity of their nation its corruption and its moral viciousness, its licentious manners and mores. And they criticized other women for conduct which was common in Rome and accepted. Their lairs and penates, penates were the most important things in their lives. And their gossip was as exciting as a bowl of stewed beans. But they were happy. They had husbands and children and gardens. And they were industrious and devoted. It was among the simpler soldiers in Antioch that Diodorus Serenius found some respite and he talked with them easily of military matters to the smothered vexation of his junior officers. The officers themselves considered that they were exiles in this country, and they longed for the delights and gaiety and vices of Rome. And they thought of their superior officer with wonder and secret derision. They never doubted his morality, but this didn't inspire their respect. Rather, they believed him a fool. Even his stern justice, which was never overcast by a moment's pettiness or caprice, was to them something inhuman. He would punish an officer as quickly as a common foot soldier no matter his family or his standing in Rome. Anus sympathized with them, and when they would wink at him over some rigid order of Diodorus, he would pompously pretend to hide a smirk. Matters had been particularly perplexing and obnoxious today. Diodorus, 
surrounded by his officers, had washed the fruits of Syria, honey, olives, and olive oil, wool, and many other things, being loaded by slaves on a Roman ship. Though it was December, the feast of Saturnalia was approaching. The sun had been unseasonably hot, the air wet with humidity, the greasy waters glittering as if covered by lighted fat. The shouts of the overseers had been exceptionally irritable, and the cracking of whips had snapped unceasingly against the wall of damp air. But the slaves, sweating profusely, were sluggish. Suddenly, with an impatient curse, Diodorus had left the table on the docks where Anus was meticulously recording the bales and the barrels, and had himself seized a particularly large box on his shoulder as easily as if it had been put on a small lamb. He had strode up the plank of the ship and hurled the box with swift precision onto the other boxes. Then he stood there, smiling happily. The officers gaped. Anus looked delicately aside. The soldiers stared. The overseers and the slaves were petrified. But Diodorus had flexed his, flexed his muscles and breathed deeply and said, eh, but that is good for a man's soul. Anus the Greek shared with all Greeks a contempt and de 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 detestation of manual labor and he was shocked to the heart. He and the others were even more shocked when Diodorus shouted to the slaves, Are you men or sickly worms? This must all be loaded before sunset, or you will work by torches in the dark. Come then, let us move like men, with a purpose, and have done with it. Again he bent and seized a barrel, and rolled it up the plank, and his muscles strained in his shoulders and legs and arms. It was obvious that he was enjoying himself. The slaves, spurred by whips, hurried back to work, and inspired by Diodorus, quickened their movements. He began to sing hoarsely in a rollicking rhythm and the slaves laughed and sang with him. Long before sunset, the ship was loaded. Not a single officer had assisted, and not even a foot soldier, for Diodorus had indicated with a contemptuous glare that he repudiated their assistance. Then, Theodorus stood among his officers and wiped himself with a kerchief one of them offered him, and he grinned at the ship. The captain approached him with odd respect, and Theodorus shouted, Tell the effete lady men in Rome that Theodorus Serenius, son of Priscus, himself helped to load this ship Tell them as they perfume themselves with nard and adder of roses and listen to the lutes and dip nightingale tongues in honey that today you've seen a Roman work as a Roman once worked and as he must work again if Rome is to survive and not die forever among vases and flowers and singing girls and wine and elegance. Then he turned to his officers, who were blushing in shame for him, and had cursed loudly and had shouted again. 
Where are your scars and your calluses, your muscles, and your brown shoulders, you exquisites? Do you know what war is, and labor, and the strength of bodies which lives barely and with fortitude? To Hades with you all, by Mercury, you are less than men, and you are less than poor slaves. This was unpardonable. The slaves snickered among themselves, and the faces of the Roman officers had darkened ominously. But they dared not reply. Diodorus was quite capable of slapping an impudent face openly. He'd done it often enough, even before foot soldiers and slaves. Theodorus, unfortunately, wasn't done. He wrathfully surveyed his men and continued, Since Amanus left his plow to save Rome, he didn't halt even to wash his stained hands or put his sandals on his soil-dusted feet. But not one of you would leave the arms of a Syrian whore to save the life of a man or to uphold in your jurisdiction a law of Rome. He'd swung away from them then and had pounded back on the docks to his horse, and it galloped off home to the suburbs. He left his chariot behind to be brought by an officer to his stables, and Annas rode in it with the officer. Once at home, Annas had related the whole horrifying episode to Iris would listen to him in silence. He expected her to be appalled, and he was appalled. But she had said mildly, with a lovely smile, the noble tribune was once my playmate in the house of Priscus. He was always a strenuous boy. He would sometimes carry me on his back and pretend that he was Jupiter in the guise of a bull, and I, Europa. She'd watched the aghast expression on Inna's face for a moment, and had added gently, Ah, but we were only children then, dear one. There were times when Inna's could not understand Iris, and he said pompously, I see that you don't grasp the larger implications of this incredible episode of today. Theodorus is constantly talking of discipline, yet he publicly derided, Oh, this is Anus. I am so sorry. Let me read that again. There were times when Anus couldn't understand Iris, and he said pompously, I see that you do not grasp the larger implications of this incredible episode today. Theodorus is constantly talking of discipline, yet he publicly derided his officers before the men and slaves. Does that enhance their authority? I was understood that Diodorus' wrath had not so much been expended on the men immediately about him, but upon the modern mores and corruption of Rome, which he couldn't endure. They had been but the precipitating factor that had relieved the smoldering and chronic rage of the tribune. She sighed and said to her husband, I am certain he will never do that again. Ennis replied severely, 
One can never be sure with such a capricious man. Let me read that again. One can never be sure with such a capricious man. I confess, I never understood him. The fury and elation of Diodorus had lasted all through the evening meal. He had told Aurelia about it and she had nodded with wifely wisdom, though the whole matter was beyond her comprehension. She let a little pause follow and then had said with anxiety, as if her husband had told her nothing at all, the little rubria is again coughing blood, as if her husband, oh, I'm sorry, and is complaining of the pains in her arms and legs. The physician has ordered effusions on her throat and her joints, and she's sleeping at last, though her face remains flushed. How sorrowful it is when a child suffers. A child has never been healthy. And how much more sorrowful it is, dear husband, that I've given you only this weak little lamb and not strong sons. Diodorus immediately forgot his anger, took his wife in his arms and kissed her. She was not revolted by the heavy stench of his sweat, but rather comforted. She wound her arms about his neck and said, But I am still only 25, and it may be that the gods will grant us sons. I must go to Antioch soon and make a special sacrifice to Juno. The child, Rubria, was heart of Diodorus' heart, though he believed only he knew this. He softly climbed the white stone stairway to her apartments and noisily moved aside the thick draperies of crimson silk. The child lay in the cool early twilight on her bed sleeping, her nurse by her side. The small window was a square of scarlet, and purple shadows, shadows hovered in the corners of the room. Was it only the reflection of the setting sun which was reddening the little face, or was it that sinister and unknown fear Theodorus bent over his daughter, and his indomitable heart fluttered at her fragility. Long, thick black lashes trembled uneasily on the thin and brightened cheek. The pretty childish mouth burned. So sweet and dear a creature so full of laughter and gaiety, even when in pain, so tender a dove. The gnarled hand of Diodorus touched the black sweep of hair on the white pillow, and he pleaded desperately to Asclepius for his help. Pray you, Master Physician, you son of Apollo, that you send Mercury on the wings of compassion to this child, who is more precious to me than life, and that your daughter Hygieia looked tenderly upon her. Mercury hastened to her, for she's not like unto you, swift as fire quick as the wind, changeful as an opal. He promised to sacrifice a cock to Asclepius, who preferred that sacrifice and a pair of 
white oxen to Mercury with golden rings in their noses. Terror seized him as he again touched Rubria's hair and saw the tremor of the small hands on the sheet. Surely it honored the gods all his life, and they wouldn't take her from him. His very heart beat. Never have I feared a sword or a spear, nor any man, nor anything. Yet I am weakened by fear tonight, he said to himself. It's not that this illness is something new, but my soul trembles as if with premonition. He renewed his prayers and added one to Juno, the mother of children. To him the gods of Rome had never been depraved, not even Jupiter, for all his propensities with regard to maidens. He wondered if he shouldn't implore Mars, his special deity, the patron of soldiers. He decided against it. Mars wouldn't understand a soldier who held a child more precious and important even than war. Such a prayer to him might inspire his anger. Theodorus hastily besought Mercury again with his winged sandals and his staff of serpents. When Theodorus joined Aurelia again, he found her in the anteroom of her chamber, industriously spinning fine wool into cloth for her child's Capidium. She was the very personification of the a matron of old Rome as she sat there, her foot moving rhythmically on the treadle, her hand at the wheel, her black hair braided severely about her round head, her pink face serious and absorbed. Her white garments flowed about her full figure in modest folds, and sleeves half covered her voluptuous arms. To Diodorus, she was a reassuring figure. Rather than wail uselessly over her child, she spun warm cloth for her. Theodorus touched her head lovingly with his hand, and then his lips. The busy foot and hand didn't falter, but Aurelia smiled. Why do you not, my beloved, walk among the gardens in the sunset? You'll find comfort there, as always. Her voice was steady and calm. Dias Doris thought of his books. Today, by special messenger, he had received a roll containing the philosophies of Philo. Rumor had it that Philo was considered superior to Aristotle. This Diodorus didn't believe, but he was both excited and curious. But all at once, a flatness and heaviness of heart came to him. And he decided to do as his wife had advised. The book could wait. He was too restless to give it his full and thoughtful attention. He stepped out into the courtyard. A dark crimson was drifting through the fronds of the palms. The scent of jasmine rose in clouds in the warm air. The ornamental orange and lemon trees were globed in golden and green fruit. 
insects hummed with the sound of thin wires. And suddenly a nightingale sang to the purpling sky. The white stones set among the exotic flower beds were flooded with the heliotrope shadows and a dim, dim blue light filled the arches of the colonnades which surrounded the courtyard. A fountain in which stood a marble fawn tinkled sweetly, mingled its frail song with the song of the nightingale, the mingled purple and crimson of the sunset glimmered in the bowl of the fountain, which was alive with brilliant little fish. Now the palms clattered a little, and a freshening wind from the distant sea, and through the moving fronds of one Diodorus could see the gleaming radiance of the evening star, the trunks of the trees set along the high walls of the yard resembled gray-white ghosts. No sound came from the high square of the house behind Diodorus. The pillars shimmered in the half-light as if made of some unsubstantial material and not marble. Diodorus found the silence suddenly oppressive. The voice of the nightingale failed to entrance him as usual. It was a voice that had no consolation in it, but only melancholy. And the fountain murmured of non-human sorrows. Theodorus, assaulted again by his loneliness, thought of Antioch and the celebrations begun there in honor of Saturn. They would end in a general debauch as usual, but at least it would be the sound of men and women. He considered riding back to Antioch and summoning a few of his officers who were at least repugnant to him, but he knew he would bore them. They would want to participate in the riotous gaiety and he would just inhibit them. If only I had a companion, thought the lonely tribune. If only there was just one with whom I could talk in order to drown out the voice of the fear in me. One with whom to share a cup of wine and discuss those things which are of importance to me. A philosopher, perhaps, or a poet, or just a man who is wise. He heard the slightest movement, almost the breath of a movement, and he turned towards the fountain again. The sunset sky brightened for an instant above the muttering heads of the palms, and it struck on the fair head of a child leaning against the marble bowl of the fountain in complete enchantment, unaware of the presence of Theodorus. Moving slightly and silently, Theodorus advanced towards the child, who was sitting on the coarse green grass and staring up at Rubria's window. When he reached the opposite side of the wide, and shallow bowl. Diodorus thought, why, it is young Lucanus, son of my freed man, Anus. His heart bounded with a nameless longing, and he thought of Iris, his old playmate, Iris, with her aureate hair her wonderful blue eyes, 
soft white flesh and round dimpled chin and her slender Grecian nose. He heard his room echoing down long and clouded corridors, the sound of her child's laughter, the questioning ever called to him. Iris, for him, hadn't existed even as a remembered playmate since her marriage to that stilted and precise mediocrity of an anus. But now he remembered that when he had been off on his campaigns before the death of his parents, Iris had shone like a star in his mind, sweet, wise Iris, his mother's young slave, his mother's petted handmaiden who had been to her as a daughter. He, a tribune, young and ambitious and stalwart, of impeachable family, unimpeachable indeed, had even dreamt of being married to Iris. His parents, he believed, in spite of their love for Iris, would have expired of humiliation if their son had condescended to a slave. And if she had said to him, Where art thou, Caius? There am I, Caia. Yet when he had heard of their deaths, while stationed in Jerusalem, his first thought after the initial pang of sorrow had been a virus. He had returned to find her not only freed, but married and pregnant, and he had put her sternly out of his mind. Surely then his loneliness had begun, and he had thought it merely a yearning to return to his active life in the Orient. The whole courtyard filled with soft mauve shadows in which the leaning head of Lucanus was like a yellow harvest moon. Theodorus could see his fine profile and he thought, it is the face of a child, Iris. He had never been interested in children, except his daughter, Rubria. And though he had wished for sons, he had thought of them as young soldiers and his heirs. Now he peered at Lucanus, his eyes straining through the colored twilight. And again, his heart bounded and was filled with tenderness. Lucanus sat in motionless silence, still gazing at the dwindling square of Rubria's window. He wore a thin white tunic his long legs so pale that they resembled alabaster were folded under him. In his hands there lay a large stone of unusual form at you, restless with a dull light. The whole attitude of Lucanus was one of purple rapture, yet he was very still. His rosy lips were parted, and the hollows of his eyes were filled with a strange blueness. It was as if he were listening, and Diodorus, superstitious, as were all Romans, watched him with a kind of nervous fear, his skin prickling. He spoke suddenly and loudly. It is you, Lucanus. The boy didn't start. He only moved a little and turned his entranced face to Diodorus. He didn't leap to his feet. He merely sat there, the stone in his hands. It was as if he didn't see the tribune at all. Diodorus was about to speak again more roughly, 
when the boy smiled and appeared to notice him for the first time. I was praying for Rubria, he said, and his voice was the voice of the young Iris. Diodorus moved around the circle of the fountain, hesitated, then squatted on his heels and looked earnestly at the boy, who sat in such utter relaxation and bemusement before him. The Tribune had removed his heavy military clothing on returning home. He wore a loose white tunic belted with simple leather inlaid with silver. And under the thin material, his browned body was square and hard, and his thick legs bulged with muscles. He folded his strong arms on his knees and contemplated Lucanus, who smiled at him with simple serenity. Lucanus was neither awed nor frightened by the soldier. He regarded the fierce dark face, beaked and stern, as tranquilly as he would have regarded his father. The harsh and jutting chin didn't alarm him, nor the sharp and penetrating black eyes set under black and swelling brows. But Diodorus confronted with the very image of the child he had once known, was conscious of his own hard round head covered with stiff black hair, shorn and lusterless, and the crude strength of his disciplined body. The boy had no business in this courtyard, thought Theodorus automatically, and then he was ashamed, remembering Iris. But what had he said? I was praying for Rubria. The two children were playmates, just he, as he and Iris had been playmates. Diodorus softened his grating voice. You are praying for Rubria, boy. Ah, she needs your prayers, the poor little one. Yes, master said Lucanius, seriously. To what god are you praying? asked Diodorus. Surely he thought the gods were especially touched by the prayers of innocence, and some of his pain lightened. Lucanus said, To the unknown god? Diodorus, dark Eyelids flickered in surprise. Lucanus was saying, My father has taught me that he is everywhere and in all things. He extended the strange stone to Diodorus simply. I found this today. It's very beautiful. Do you think he is here? and that he hears me. And that's the end of chapter one. And believe me, it moves on at a steady pace. Just simply a great book. Don't miss another chapter of Dear and Glorious Physician.